now we have Greg Mickelson from Zurf. Um, you probably saw their logo in quite a few places because Zurf was uh, one of the two diamond sponsors of JupyterCon and who actually helped a lot make JupyterCon possible. Zurf has been a stealth startup for uh, some time now and they are announcing what it's all about right now and launching the new products. So please give a round of applause to Greg. All right, excellent. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I think I'm last, right? Is this the last thing of the day? Wow, OK. Lightning talks. What's that? Lightning talks. Oh, lightning talks, right. OK, so you guys have the, the perseverance. Uh, so I appreciate everyone sticking around. Uh, my name is Greg Michelson. I uh, came into the AI software world in 2015 when I joined a company called Data Robot. Anyone hear of Data, Ro Data Robot? Uh, arguably one of the inventors of automated machine learning. I was uh, like number 30 at Data Robot when I left. Uh, we had around 1,500 employees, huge, huge company. I was the chief customer officer there. Uh, and I learned a tremendous amount of stuff. And when I joined Data Robot, we thought that this was kind of a picture of what automated machine learning would be like. Uh, very futuristic and a little light on content. Uh, because nobody had ever really done it or talked about it or s tried to sell it uh, or, or anything like that before. And so we went out to the market and we started writing demos and we started talking to customers and telling people that everybody could be a data scientist and anybody can do machine learning with, with, uh, with automated machine learning and with data robot. But what we ended up with was something a little bit more like this after five years of kind of going out and trying to find people to actually use this technology. I love this movie. This is Modern Times. Uh, <laughs> first demo on dummy data. Oh, OK. Mm, I like corn. It's good. Seems to be working. Definitely worth 250000 a year. Uh-oh. Real data. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> so I've seen this lots of times. So, but when I left Data Robot, we had a, a team of four or five uh, hundred people whose job it was to support all of our customers, and uh, finding out that. Uh, just feeding data into a machine and having magic happen and outcome models at the end that you could just magically use uh, turned out to be challenging, to say the least, uh, for, for all the companies that have done that. And I think it's pretty widely agreed at this point that the citizen data scientist, if not uh, completely non-existent, is at least super rare. I've never seen one except in grainy photographs uh, in national parks. Um, so you end up with something like this when you use automated machine learning. And the, promise was, uh, the premise was that there are so many machine learning tasks out there that uh, you can't possibly tackle all of them with code. And so you need a solution to uh, make it easier to take on all of these projects, right? And <clears throat> you don't really need to know what's going on with the training. We can abstract away all of the detail there uh, and just leave you with the models. Trust us, everything's going to be OK. Uh, you don't need to know all that stuff. We've pretty well figured it out. And you should try and predict everything that you possibly can as fast as possible, even if the predictions aren't very good, uh, and then just iterate and get better and better and better over time. This is kind of the talk track that, that we developed that is sort of like, come to be the way that people think about automated machine learning. And there's some good news in the story. Uh, automated machine learning actually does build good models. Uh, you know, the tech actually works. Like, you can really build good models that make good predictions, that are well-tuned, uh, that can be used in lots and lots of different applications. And it really does implement best practices. So, Setting up a proper cross-validation is, uh, you know, it has to be done correctly. And so there's some benefit in having uh, a tool that will set those kinds of things up for you. 
and anybody actually can use the software. So if you have an automated machine learning program, it's very straightforward. You upload your data set and push go, and out come models. So this kind of thing does actually, there's some good news there. That, that's all good. Um, but flexibility is probably the biggest problem when it comes to automated machine learning. So if anybody has ever used these types of tools, um, they only work on a subset, a small subset of the types of problems that you face. I'll give you an example. While I was at DataRobot, COVID broke out and everything shut down and we started focusing on the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And we looked around and we looked at the CDC's forecasts for how the, vi the virus was spreading and we thought we can do better than this. And so we started working on a machine that would forecast the spread of COVID at a county level on a daily basis within the United States. And we built it, but we built it all from scratch. We didn't use one line of code from DataRobot uh, because the problem was just unique. And that's what you come across when you encounter these real world problems is that you have to tweak these, the solution so much to make it fits the problem that a canned solution, an automated type solution, oftentimes is just not feasible to implement. So flexibility is a huge problem. Uh, another issue is that the, these types of solutions that you run with your mouse, they only do what they can do. So, uh, you know, if you want it to implement, um, you know, some new algorithm, then the software developer has to build that feature and then you can get it when they release it. You can't write your own extensions, you can't uh, contribute to these things in any real way. They're closed ecosystems and so they only do what they can do. And so you're kind of stuck with what the tools do. And if it does what you need, then great. If not, then you need a whole nother tool to replace it with. The third problem, uh, <laughs> the people who want to use these automated machine learning tools mostly don't know why they should be using them in the first place. So when I left DataRobot, I had four or 500 people on the success team and 100 of them were former McKinsey consultants uh, that all they did was go around to companies and do use case workshops to try and teach them what they needed machine learning for in the first place. Uh, because we'd gone out to citizen data scientists and we had sold them automated machine learning and then we found out when renewal time came around that they didn't really know why they needed it or what they needed it for. And so we hired management consulting team to try and generate some demand for all the people that we'd sold our software to, which is crazy, but uh, a fact. And then the fourth uh, issue with these types of automated machine learning tools is that pricing is an absolute mess. Uh, nobody really knows how to price uh, machine learning tools yet, as far as I can tell. Um, the market seems to have moved towards like a consumption-based type pricing, but uh, everybody's afraid of leaving money on the table. And so the price for these types of tools is super, super high. So if you go out and try and buy some of these mouse-driven products, that were very expensive to develop and are sold top down by you know, these uh, sales bros, you, uh, you will inevitably find pretty large price tags on these types of solutions. Uh, but what you end up with is a big black box with a window into it that lets you see some stuff. So you can evaluate your models maybe, you can compare them, try to find some uh, some good models that, that might exist, and then you can get predictions out. But at the end of the day, the stuff that's going on under there, you may have a window into it, but you can't really do that much stuff with it. And there is quite a lot actually going on under the hood there. So, for example, uh, cloud orchestration, you know, getting the, the resources together to actually do the, the compute. Uh, and then certainly production is another question. But the meat of what's going on is all of the feature engineering and cross-validation and training and evaluation and all that stuff that's going on uh, right there under the hood. That's all the interesting stuff. That's all the stuff that data scientists are really good at. And for the most part, the only people generating value from this type of technology are doing it with code. So uh, why am I talking about this? Because I left DataRobot in 2021 and I'm now at another AI software company that I co-founded with a couple of really great guys. And we're not really doing automated machine learning either. We, we've got another focus. But we have uh, created a, a, a product, a package, 
uh, that we're calling pipelines. And pipelines is a, a package that goes in between this whole component and all of this stuff over here. And it's intended to be automated machine learning for experts. Uh, automation that will actually help people who know what all this stuff is and what it's all for to do their jobs more effectively, faster, better, and to get to good results faster. And we're only charging $175,000 per year, per user, per model, per prediction. <laughs> per second. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're actually going to open source it. So earlier this week, we open sourced pipelines. Uh, and I want to show you what it does here in a minute. There's a QR code if you want to get in there. Uh, Pipelines is basically automation machine automated machine learning for experts. I'm going to show you exactly what it does here in a second. But we'd love to uh, you know, have some people get up in there and use it and give us some feedback and contribute and all that kind of thing. So uh, this will be available to folks. But remember, <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> I love the first row. <clears throat> it's, it's new. It's like really new. Uh, it is. Oh, and we're small, and we, we need some help. So let's, let's give a demo. I want to show you exactly what this thing does. And this should be interesting since, since uh, <laughs> my monitor is not showing what's up there. So we're, we're just going gonna, gonna to turn sideways. Where is my mouse? There it is. All right. Awesome. All right. So here's a Jupyter notebook. How are we on size? Can you guys see? Bigger. All right. How's that? Better? OK, bueno. All right, I mean, uh, très bien. Right? It's France, huh? OK. <laughs> so we're going to import some packages. Uh, and then we're going to start out by just listing some of the models that are supported. So Pipeline supports, right now, supervised learning for regression and classification type problems. And we've got a number of models that are included. Inside Pipelines, it's not just model training and tuning. We're also doing things like. Uh, setting up your cross-validation. We're doing things like uh, feature engineering, missing value imputation, uh, TFIDF, stuff like that for text variables, uh, one-hot encoding, different types of encoding for categoricals. We're essentially taking a data set, and we're going to try to give you the boilerplate code that gets you to a good starting point to actually s begin tweaking your pipelines and making them work. Okay? So these are the just a list of models that are available on the regression front right now. We're going to import uh, a data set, a uh, housing data set. And then we're going to just create a, a pipelines object here. We're going to name our, we're going to specify our, our data set and our target, the thing we're trying to predict, model type. And then I just picked four models, uh, in this case, elastic net, random forest, decision tree, and gradient boosting, and how many folds in our cross-validation. And we'll run that guy. Uh, this is going to set up some hyperparameter tuning by default. So every model has default hyperparameter tuning that you might want to run uh, in order to, to optimize those models in the cross-validation. And so I've just printed out the, the dictionary of all the parameters here. These are all editable and changeable within the package or after. Uh, and then we'll go down after that, and we'll say, get the code. And what that does is it actually outputs the code for the actual training. So instead of like a, a traditional automated machine learning, which takes your data set, trains and tunes the models, and then gives you the models and says, here, go and make some predictions. I hope these models are good for you. We're going to give you the code so that you can look at the code and say, OK, uh, I don't really want to do median imputation for these variables. I'd really like to do some mean imputation. And, and you know, maybe uh, I don't want to do ordinal encoding here. I'd rather do one hot encoding, or what, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and so here's the code that you get, and it's here. And so we'll go and we'll just copy that code to the clipboard. I can also write it to a file uh, if I want to. And here it is down here. It's just saving those five models out to separate.py files. And I can take and paste the code, and I could just run it directly. And so now it's actually training those models. And I can see what the output looks like. Here's 
predicted versus actual for that first model. You can see it's not very good. Hopefully the next one will be good. But the point is that you've got the code to actually dive in and get started with your, your process. Now, is this earth shattering code? Like, is there like deep IP here? No, everybody in this room has written probably a thousand scikit-learn pipelines before, but you know, it might take you two hours to write this pipeline. And here suddenly I have the code I need to get started and I can, can dive into it. Now the fact that it's open source means that you can actually take it and do some interesting stuff with it um, in other types of environments. So here, for example, is the, pro the company I actually work for, Zerve. Uh, and what we're trying to do is build a data science development environment <coughs> where you can do things that are uh, you know, more production-y, production right? Where you can try and keep the entire life cycle in the, in the tool. So let me see, I closed all my, my windows here. So if I go to here, I'm gonna just take a Jupyter notebook and a data set and just drag I can get my mouse to work. Drag. <laughs> my hand-eye coordination is being tested here. Why isn't that working? What's that? Oh, there it is. All right, perfect. All right, so <clears throat> uh, what Zerv is doing is it's actually going to take and parse that uh, notebook into uh, a graph. And so our tool here, what it does is it will uh, it'll basically look at the dependencies inside of your notebook uh, or any code that you write, and it'll, it'll find those dependencies and it'll give you some parallelization here. Uh, you see I have it open in another window somewhere, so that's my mouse. This is running in AWS, and so uh, you know, this code is starting to execute here, and you can see that that notebook, which was previously single-threaded, has just hit a fork where it's now training uh, three models at once here, and it's gonna start merging these th streams back together in order to do some model comparison type stuff and things like that. But we've integrated pipelines here, and so I can drag pipelines down onto this, uh, this, uh, this block, and it'll connect in, and so I can go out here, and maybe I'll just click on my gear, and I can pick my data set, and I can choose my target, just like you saw in code, and in this case, the classification model, and I'll just run these four, say, and then we'll continue. And I can set up my cross-validation uh, grid search in the same way with my model tuning. And when I'm done, here I go, and I've got that same code that I produced uh, in my uh, in my Jupyter notebook, but now I'm looking at it inside of Zerv or any other environment where you might want to use this package uh, so that I can actually have a look and see what's going on here. So we're super proud to, uh, to be uh, contributing here to the, the open source community. It's really important. It's one of our company values here. And you can see there's a lot of, I hope you can see that there's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on on the screen. I don't really want to do a Zerv commercial here. Uh, but we are launching our public beta observe today as well. So lots of stuff being launched. If you want to come by and, and see it, learn what it's all about at our booth, that would be fantastic. But the point here today is that at the end of the day, the people who are generating value from uh, machine learning are the people that are writing code. And so we're super passionate about giving coders, about giving experts, about giving uh, data scientists the tools that they need to be able to build uh, what they want to build in the best and most efficient way possible. So that's what we're, we're looking at. Uh, that's all I had. I wanted to give you guys a preview of pipelines and invite you to contribute. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. Do you have the method function to generate the code for uh, computing predictions as, as, as because you showed that the, that you can generate the, the code for training and what about predictions and for example uh, if you will have a uh, missing feature uh, missing missing uh, values in feature one for example in the training data but 
when you will uh, deploy the model, uh, you will have missing, feature, uh, missing values in feature two, uh, you, if the code can handle this. Yeah, so Thank there's, you. your question is getting at a lot of the complexity here, right? So, um, so there's a lot, of, a lot to do. Right now we have, in pipelines, we have training code. Um, what you do with it after is another question. So let's say, let's say that I get new data when I'm making predictions that I've never seen before, maybe a new categorical value uh, in a categorical feature, or I get a value in a, um, a numeric variable, or a missing value in a numeric variable when I didn't have any missing values in my training data, that sort of stuff. Th there's lots of edge cases where you have to be super careful about what you're doing and make sure that you actually have a good solution. So we are planning for those. Like I said, we've just open sourced it today. We've got some basic functionality, things that still need to be added, things like model comparison, a lot of model uh, diagnostics and things like that. All that stuff needs to come in. Uh, all the production stuff, like there's lots and lots of work to do there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's stuff that, you know, it, it, these are solved problems that people have done before. It's just a matter of, you know, can we build the tools to make it easier to use? So, really good question. You mentioned that it's open source. Which uh, license are you using? I didn't see one in the repo. Oh, uh, we'll probably use something like a, a Creative Commons Zero or something. I don't, I don't know what they, they've done, but it'll be a very open uh, license that would allow for things like commercial use and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. That's a lawyer question. We just, we just closed our, our seed round, and I, I'm not speaking to lawyers right now. So, I would so. just like to get back to the uh, citizen data scientists, because yes. I think they do exist, and some place where you can find them is Wikimedia Projects. So uh, Wikimedia Projects run their own uh, instances of Jupyter, for instance, in order to feed data into the Wiki ecosystem. And there are lots of small little use cases where you can find them, you can uh, engage with them, and uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, that's fair. Um, everybody's got a bit of a different definition of what, what we mean by, uh, by citizen data scientists, and I say it mainly to just be glib and uh, evoke a reaction because I love attention. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, by, by citizen data scientists don't exist, I don't mean to belittle anybody's contribution or anything like that. I, I'm simply saying that uh, you can't just take my grandma and give her an automated machine learning tool and tell her to go and build AI. It's, it's going to be a diff very difficult slog to do something like that. Perhaps not impossible, uh, but certainly not straightforward. No, no offense to grandmas. I love my Nana. <laughs> Any other question? Well, I have one. Huh. Um, so the, um, the static analysis of the notebook that you do analyzing dependencies, have you considered like sort of taking this out and to allow uh, like more broader parallelization with any framework that you, we may like of, uh, and even beyond notebooks, dividing any code file into other things than like predetermined cells so that we could run this kind of analysis and automatically parallelize anything. Yes, in fact, we have the code to do that sort of thing. So um, it becomes incredibly difficult to read. So you, you have to strike a balance between uh, like massive parallelization and optimization and readability. In fact, the first version of notebook parsing that we built into, uh, into Zerve uh, parsed every line separately and, and tried to build the parallelization that way. And you end up with a, a hugely complex graph that runs optimally, but uh, super, super uh, opaque. So there is a, probably a feature there, um, but uh, the number one thing in our view as far as building a tool like this is user experience. And so we erred on the side of readability and keeping the structure that existed in the notebook rather than sort of blowing it up and, and optimizing it to the max. At some point, we will probably put in a, uh, the ability for the user to kind of adjust the, the level of, of complexity that they want their resulting output to have when you parse something like that. But keep in mind, uh, the Jupyter parsing is primarily a, uh, a warm start idea inside of Zerve. It's, at some point, once you become a Zerve user, you, won't be, you, won't, you, know, you may not be starting with every project with a Jupyter notebook. You may be starting in, in Zerve to begin with, in which case you can structure the, the, pres the, the canvas however you like. So.
Hi. So Hi. Um, watching um, using pipeline library to generate the code, uh, things like Copilot or ChatGPT come to mind. How do those compare right now? And you know, are you considering using those large language model in the future to generate those? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Uh, it, right now, my experience with with uh, with ChatGPT, I'm I'm a bit uh, skeptical of the some of the large language stuff, mainly because the details of setting up these models are are pretty pretty important, uh, and I want to know I want to have a sense for what's actually going to happen. It, I typically I personally am not going into these situations where I'm like, gee, I'd like a model pipeline now. And I don't particularly care how we handle missing values or you know, how, we, how we do whatever, right? how we do these steps. Typically, I'm going into these with a, a pretty, pretty clear idea of how I want the thing to work. And so having sort of a fixed template that I can get started with as far as boilerplate goes that I know, you know does the, these things in a specific way is going to keep me from having to like sort through this code. Also, ChatGPT at this, at this point doesn't often is limited, the context length is limited enough that you run out of uh, space before you actually get to where you, where you need to be on that front, so. It's a bit uh, chaotic. So, anyway. Uh, maybe fo do you have a follow-up question? Oh, I can? Oh, yeah, so also looking at, you know, code generation tools, uh, have you found any good, like you had to copy-paste the code you generated into Drupalcell, is there any tools you've seen in Drupal App? It's also a question to community, kind of. Tools I've seen to what? Tools to kind of maybe create a different cell type or kind of automate this, you know, code generation so that it will go back to your cell. So you don't have to copy paste it. Yeah, there's probably some 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 glue code or some tooling that you could build there. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, so we're we're open to ideas on that front as well. I think that's a, a potentially really interesting thing. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I can't see any, any, everyone in the back, so if there was a question from people in the dark over there, please shout, and I'll run. All right, I think this okay. is it, so. Thank you very much.